Now, is that not something really special or what? And hopefully, if this works, uh, I put this fader up and, uh, um, well, hang on a minute, I'm getting a bit of distortion here. Can you hear me, Ryan? I can hear you just fine, John. Yep, it's, oh, I've just got a bit of distortion on the, on the line here. That's cool. You, you okay at that end? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay then, mate. Um, thanks for, uh, sort of like, uh, phoning in to us, mate. Um, we're loving the album over here. Um, well, we're loving your, your entire career over here, to be honest uh -huh. with you. Uh, tell us a bit about the Crash Street Kids. I mean, how did you get together in the first place? Oh, so we're going back to the old stories. Oh, I love, I love telling the old stories. Um, okay, well, let me start at the beginning. I'll keep it as quick as I can. But uh, the drummer and I, drummer is A.D. Adams, monster drummer. Um, him and I first worked together in, uh, we were playing with uh, the original guitarist for Alice Cooper, uh, Michael Bruce. Mm -hmm. He played uh, on the original stuff and wrote a lot of that early Alice Cooper, that great School's Out, Killer, and Love It to Death, Billion Dollar Babies, all that stuff. So we were actually doing a record with him, and uh, the records just turned out great. Um, it was going to be called The Dark Side of Love, and uh, but at the last moments, um, it was scrapped. Michael scrapped the whole record. So AD and I, uh, undeterred, we decided to keep on going, so I songs that I had written that I brought to the table and we just decided to keep that going, you know, and, and we we've been in bands, different styles of bands and stuff over the years, from you know, rock, metal, whatever. And this this time when we started the new project, we just wanted to do something that was completely well, um, not popular <laughs> and do uh, glam rock and stuff that we love because I grew up listening to Bowie and Kiss and T Rex and and so did A D. And so he turned me on to some bands I hadn't heard of before, and, and I turned him on to some bands, and, and we just kind of fell in love with this style of music and said, let's just do this, and who cares if it's popular? We loved it, we dug it. So we kind of started there, and we really had no intention at first of doing anything other than just recording a few songs for our own enjoyment, you know. But as things moved on, it seemed like it was going really well, and we decided to add some other players, and next thing you know... Uh, we got tons of albums out now, <laughs> and it's just been a, a, one of the greatest joys of my life up to this point, you know? It's a great, great group of guys, and just such a fun thing, and we have our own little scene, our own little clique here in, here in Phoenix, and it's just uh, just a blast, man. Yeah, and, um, you know, what the remarkable thing, which the thing that kind of sealed the deal with me is, uh, as far as your music's concerned, your first three albums sort of like um, form a kind of concept story, don't they? The uh, Supersonic Star Show trilogy uh, right. about the uh, character of the kid who, um, well, I mean, I'm not going to give the story away. People are going to have to buy the albums and have a listen. But was that uh, an intentional concept or did that just kind of fall together? It, it really just fell together and it wasn't until the second album, Chemical Dogs, that we really went full on with, with the concept and said that this is what we're going to do. We're going to follow this storyline. Um, so really the first record, um, the storyline really isn't set other than the fact that we wanted that first record to sound like a rock concert from the 70s. So that was really the, the loose, there wasn't much of a storyline behind it so much. Um, it was fairly loose. So when Chemical Dogs came around, it was definitely like what happens next to this rock star guy and then basically the next uh, two albums would follow that uh, to its conclusion. Yeah, not um, give it away the storyline, but who came up with that twist at the end of Transatlantic Suicide? Because I think that's a work of genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I, I came up with some of it and, and the AD, the drummer, came up with, with some of it as well. So, and, and, you, and not to discount Ricky and Deuce because we're all four together and we're all hanging out we're listening to records we're working on the tunes and and we're just palling around and then we start talking about what could we do with the kid what could happen here what, what should we do and so we start hashing out the storyline or hashing out even it might start with a song title I know that in our uh, in our rehearsal space in the studio we call it Shabby Road we have this big uh this big sign that we write song titles on and uh, about 90% of them are jokes <laughs> but every once, in a, every once in a while we'll have um, 
you know, a, a song title that's on there that actually works and we use. <laughs> Okay, well, so you, you did a really impressive live album uh, last year, wasn't it? Yes, uh, it came out last year, recorded about a year and a half ago, I think it was, maybe longer now. Um, it was recorded at uh, Alice Cooper's Town, which is a club here in Phoenix, one of the larger clubs. And we recorded it over two nights. And I, I, I really love that record a lot. I mean, I love all of our records, but that one holds a special place for me because my favorite record of all time is Kiss Alive. And I've been listening to that record since I was about six years old, and I'd be bopping around my room with a tennis racket and pretending to be, you know, Paul Stanley and Ace Greeley kind of wrapped <laughs> up in one. <laughs> so uh, for me to, to grow up and to be uh, have sort of a document uh, similar to that is really, really cool. Not that we have near the amount of fans that KISS did on KISS Live 1 in attendance, but still it's it's the, of the same vibe, and, yeah. and uh, I was gonna say. really excited to have it. I was going to say, because nearly everyone that I know that's heard it has turned around and said it kind of, as a kind of live, as you said, live document. It's kind of got that kind of same vibe as Thin Lizzy's Live and Dangerous, uh, Ted Nugent's, is it Intensity, Intensities, so you Kiss Live, all that kind of thing. It's a cracking album. Now, yeah, and it's really, and it's legit, you know, you can tell that it's real, you can hear the crowd, you, you can tell that there's no overdub, it's not fake, it, it's totally real, there's mistakes, there's... Uh, there you can hear confetti cannons going off and all kinds of stuff. You know, it's it's a really fun fun record to sit back and listen to. Yeah, which brings me to your live shows. I mean, um, I mean, obviously, I've never been to Phoenix and I've never seen you guys live, which is one of my biggest regrets in life so far. Um, oh, we'll do it someday. Yeah, <laughs> but what I was going to say is, um, your live shows are beginning to sort of like create a bit of a mythos. You do this whole kind of. You know, quite a high budget stage production, don't you? With graffiti artists opening up, and you know, you get the, yeah. the dancing cheerleaders and this kind of thing. You know, how does yeah, that... yeah, carry on, yeah. Well, well, what happened with that is we had you know the first record, the Supersonic Star Show, and uh, we just didn't feel that it was right for us to play that record in front of people and not have something that was at least a little supersonic, you know. Just sitting there in, in jeans and a t-shirt and, and playing these songs about this big grandiose rock star concert just didn't seem right so we started to uh, piece together what we could do on our limited budget you know that would be something uh, unique definitely but larger than life for at least as much as we can get fit into a club so AD the drummer was drawing like stage plots and things like that and it seemed crazy to me that we would ever accomplish this but you can't tell ad adams no <laughs> and to a certain extent you can't tell any of us no so he had the thing built and we we kind of sat with power tools and we built this huge stage with uh, using scaffolding and uh, ramps and and totally uh homemade we had carpenters coming in we built this giant stage and so to, have, to augment the stage we got cheerleaders and i told ad i was like we'll never get girls to work for free and, and be cheerleaders on stage. But sure enough, we found girls, good-looking girls, too, that would, <laughs> that would do it. And we had kids that would spray paint our stage, um, kind of give it that street sort of graffiti look. And then we got a uh, piano riser that shot me up during Mandy and the Leapers about uh, 25 feet. <laughs> and I'm afraid of heights, so I wasn't uh, really excited about that. But after I did it a few times, it was <laughs> yeah, okay. scary. And people can see a lot of this stuff. There are quite a few YouTube clips up, aren't there, of you performing live with that stage set? Yeah, there's um, a few clips of us um, live at Cooperstown. And, of course, if you check out our videos uh, that we did for Do You Still Believe in Rock and Roll? And, uh, um, well, Destroyer doesn't have our stage, but still you can kind of get a glimpse of, uh, of of what the stage show looks like. The cheerleaders are in there. And, confetti mm. cannons going off and all that crap you know and having seen your uh, videos um i was surprised that you've got a quite a young audience i mean you've got sort of guys my age in their 30s and 40s watching you and digging your mm -hmm. stuff but you've got a lot of teenagers following you around as well and over there in the states haven't you yeah and, and i gotta be honest that surprised me as well um it just sort of took off in that direction which is great i don't think they had really seen anything like that and they weren't terribly, to them it was all new. 
you know, like, what are these guys wearing? And look at this crazy stage show. And they start telling their friends. And next thing you know, the, the audience is largely made up of 15-year-old, um, you know, 15 to 17-year-olds. Which you know, is, and then, like you said, we had the older crowd too. So it was like almost there were there were occasions, and there still are, where there's a 15 year old and their dad, and they both love it equally because dad remembers it from back, you know, way back, and then the, the kid is it's all new to them and they were loving it too. So it's a really funny thing to see that happen, but it's it's so great, you know. For and it's, really you know, and it's in, and it, you know, it shows the sort of like quality of the Crush Street kids, the fact that they can cater for you know, three generations of the same family and entertain them all. Yeah, yeah, we're very lucky in that respect, you know. Um, we just seem to hit on, on something. And you know what it is really is that I think people respond to, you're, we're honest in what we do. We love doing it. We're not, it's not a gimmick. This is what we think is cool. We, we like putting on a big show. We like wearing the clothes that we wear because that's what we love. It's not that, hey, let's try this because maybe we'll get some attention. It's, no, this is what we think makes a good rock and roll show. Yeah, it's you know? entertainment, and that's what rock and roll's about, the bottom line, isn't it? Right, yeah, so you can't fake that. You can't fake the love that we're putting out for what we're doing, and I think we get it back, you know, from, from the audience, and it's just it's a great relationship that we have. Okay, now moving on to the new album, Sweet Creatures, another concept work. Is this yeah. going to stand alone, or is because it's got the, as people are going to hear in a minute, it's got a, an ending that kind of, I said when I wrote the review for it last week, it makes you want to go, ah, what's happening next? You know? <laughs> Would you want to tell, tell people a little bit about the album, from your point, from your perspective? Yeah, the, um, first of all, the storyline of the record, and, and everybody's heard the first half of it, it's following uh, two runaways who run away from their homes, and they're living on the street. And they meet up with one another. It's a boy and a girl. So they start falling in love with one another. But while they're living on the street, they also turn to prostitution. And they also turn to drugs and meet all these uh, seedy characters like transvestites and pimps and things like that. And at this point in the album where we just left off, um, they have met one another. That would be Bang Bang, You're Beautiful. And then he's trying to woo her, that sad Julia. And then now they have uh, discovered drugs and scoring some drugs from a local drug dealer. And next, we're going to turn to prostitution on side two. <laughs> so, um, and then as far as carrying the work on, I don't know. We're going to kind of see. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't really talked about it too much. <laughs> but I know that we've talked about doing, um, working with a, a string quartet for our next thing. And I don't know if it's going to be a full record or just maybe a couple of, of tracks. Wow. And uh, if we feel that that partnership lends itself to this particular storyline, then we'll probably move forward with it because uh, it's, it's interesting and it's going to be kind of a cool story to write for um, in the sense that we can do a lot of things with these characters because they're, you know, the sky's the limit. You yeah. can put them in all kinds of situations. Um, this album um, is the first one that's had an official European release or getting an official European release, hasn't it? Because the others have only been available on import. Yeah. Yeah, this one... Um, and I wish I knew the name of the the, the label that it's going to be. I know seven. we work with Sanity, um, but I don't know if there's a an, a UK imprint that's different. But it should be out in October, so you should be able to go to your local record store and pick it up, um, and also available on iTunes um, and all that online stuff, of course. But if you just can't wait, you can get it as an import. It's going to be out in the States um, in just a couple weeks. And I recommend everyone rushes out and buys it because I've been playing it non-stop since your manager okay. sent me a copy the other day. You know? um, finally, um, now I know that I've been hammering on at all your websites and people. There's not, I'm not the only one over here in Europe that's been begging you to come over and see us at some point. Any news of any kind of UK dates coming up or European dates? Well, that has been something that we have tried to work out for the last couple years and uh, it, it's a matter of money or agents or not having a record deal and so, so far we've encountered every um, every mistake or, or every problem problem that you could have um, so this summer we're going to try it again by God and somehow we're going to get over there the thing is about us is that we kind of we want to figure out what we want to do with the stage show and all of that but I'd be happy just going and uh, just playing a stripped down show 
um, you know, just to cut on costs and stuff. But there's, yeah, it's got, there's got to be a way, you know, and, and we're going to try again this summer. Um, we are going to do a U.S. Uh, jaunt in the spring, we're talking, which is going to take us around uh, up the California coast and all the way into the Midwest and hopefully some East Coast states as well. But Europe has been something that we've been dying to do, and we're not going to stop until we get there. Okay, then, Mike, we'll, we'll press on with the rest of the album, because I don't want to run your phone, your transatlantic phone bill up too much. It might lead to transatlantic suicide. So, um, <laughs> um, thanks ever so much for coming in, uh, for phoning in. Um, we'll hopefully maybe do a hook-up again at, at some point in the future, or, you know, hopefully, you know, sometime next year, you'll be in the country and you'll be able to actually come in the studio for the whole show. Absolutely, John, and I just want to take a minute to thank you so much from all of us guys for all your support over the years. You were one of the first ones who believed in us, and, and it really helps us to move things along. So just want to say thank you, and thank you for a times a million, and cheers, um, because we love you, and we love the show, and uh, we listen all the time. And uh, so I hope, I hope that we can get over there and meet face-to-face, because I feel like we're old friends. <laughs> yeah, and as I said, I've been promising to introduce you guys to uh, Bristol Cider, which you said you've never actually drunk. I, I have not, but I'm I'm up for anything. I'll try anything twice. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, well, I mean, you haven't lived until you've drunk the cider in Bristol, so... Anyway, AD, uh, sorry, sorry, Brian, thanks very much, mate. You're an absolute diamond, and um, I'll, I wish you all the best for the uh, album coming out on the tour, and we'll speak again at some point soon. Same to you, John. Thank you so much, my friend. Okay, you take care then, mate, and we'll carry on with uh, the next track on the album, which is, I believe, the Third Avenue Vampire. All right. Have at it. I love that one. <laughs> okay, take care, mate. See you soon. Bye. Okay, John. Bye-bye.